and uh, uh, Prerna, so this has to be wound up in an hour's yeah. time, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. I'll easily finish. Not a problem. All right. A very good afternoon to everyone and a all welcome uh, for joining for today's topic that is career path in astronomy with Professor Priya Hassan. So uh, welcome you, ma'am, for this uh, online session. So about Dr. Priya Hassan, I would like to give you a little introduction that growing up in Mumbai, Dr. Priya went to USSR to pursue her integrated master's in physics at the Maslow State University, Russia. She did her PhD in astronomy in Usmania University, Hyderabad in 2004. She did an Indo-French postdoctoral research project at the Inter uh, University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune, and worked as DST women scientist in Usmania University from 2006 to 2009. She taught at Jha College of Engineering and Technology, Hyderabad from 2010 to 15, and later joined Mulana Azad National Urdu University, Hyderabad in 2015. Today, uh, Dr. Priya will be sharing career path in astronomy for all the budding aspiring astrophysicists or the space enthusiasts to how to uh, formalize their decision of uh, being an astrophysicist. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Prerna. And um, so <clears throat> like Prerna mentioned, I'll be talking to you about career paths in astronomy, not just astrophysics. So I will just add on as we proceed and you'll see. So I'm at Maulana Azad National Urdu University, which is in Hyderabad. You can see my email also below. So in case somebody wants to get in touch, you can, you're most welcome to get in touch. If you want some further help and this thing, please do contact me. Yeah, so, uh, so astronomy is one of the oldest of sciences, right? It's the scientific study of stars, planets, comets, galaxies, generally known as the celestial bodies. It's also the study of all phenomena outside the Earth's atmosphere, which is essentially, there's a 100 kilometer limit, which is the beginning of space. So once you're above 100 kilometers on the atmosphere, you're out in space, right? And it basically integrates the knowledge of mathematics, physics, chemistry, evolution, motion of celestial objects, meteorology, various things. And therefore, I'd, I'd be actually touching a little bit about all these possible career paths, which actually intersect with all these different areas of study. Now, how so today what I'd be basically talking about, how do you become an astronomer in India and what are the possible career paths which you can actually opt for if you like astronomy. <clears throat> now, the baseline for astronomy, astrophysics as we know it, essentially you need a good understanding of physics, mathematics, computers, chemistry and many other subjects, right? So, um, so what are typically, what are the things that astronomers do? So astronomers, some of them observe. They observe and study the nature of matter and energy in the universe. Some of them, not everybody has to observe. There are people who like to do theory. And um, then there are people who also like to do simulations. They simulate data and actually study data of that kind. And based on these things, their observations, their theory, their simulations, they do research on space, stars, moons, galaxies, etc. Essentially, what you do is that when you when you do your research, if it's original research, then you actually publish it in journals. And a journal publication means it actually gets reviewed, peer reviewed. And uh, there are people who actually assess your findings, check whether the results you've got are valid, whether they are meaningful. And based on that, you publish the findings in journals. You may participate in seminars, conferences, meetings where you actually talk about your results and uh, you know discuss it with colleagues etc if you take the academic role you decide to actually stick to academia you would actually spend most of your professional life conducting research writing research papers lecturing students presenting your research findings at academic conferences all around and uh, uh, a lot of the time like astronomers like me what we basically do is we basically do a lot of complex calculations of analysis and evaluation of data. I mean, I work with data and hence, before that data, you will need to do computers. Similarly, if you were doing simulations or even for your theory, you may also need to do computers. You may use computers to solve differential equations. You may do various things with computers. And uh, what we basically do is we describe, express our observations in mathematical terms. 
we use the language of mathematics to describe our findings to evaluate them etc analyze the data which we have we also report experimental results by writing papers etc and like i mentioned earlier you may do some kind of computer simulations to model physical data to better understand it develop theories etc so that's the typical kind of things that astronomers do which is essentially what people in basic sciences research also do right other than actually doing hardcore research you may also like to do a lot of other things like there are some people who start off with research but then even like to do science outreach popularization and education so here i have examples of a few people in india who are actually doing it so whom you see over here is a friend all of their friends this is rakesh rao he actually like makes movies in science so this is one of the awards he got for presenting a film on science in the science film festival you could have this is uh, nikita who actually does public outreach is an organization called sserd then there are these people who are actually there is vasudev mukund who you see over here he writes science articles for the wire you have mukund tate who is from ncbs as well as pallav bagla from ndtv they basically involved in science journalism and so they could be uh, using the medium of using various media digital media press media to actually um, you know uh, share scientific results with people and uh, you know work on that kind so uh, sometimes some of these people start off as scientists and end up into this or some of them directly go through journalism but they specifically focus on science so and then these people many of these kind of people could actually play an important role in planetaria and science magazines and journalism movie media etc but even that's one of the options which one can do if that's what you find interesting but essentially when people talk about astronomy they talk about astrophysics or space science and astrophysics is the branch of space science that that applies the laws of physics and chemistry to understand the universe and our place in it right and uh, it basically involves study of the birth life and death of stars planets galaxies nebulae other objects in the universe and that's essentially what people who do astrophysics or space science do so what are the key studies required if you want astrophysics for example or space science for this obviously you need to have a lot of critical thinking because you have to do independent research it's a continuous learning process so you should enjoy learning you should enjoy reading because you'll have to be doing that all life there'll always be something new which is coming out which you need to study and you need to research essentially it is science physics mathematics complex problem solving data interpretation high research cap capacity as well as social perceptiveness these are the typical kind of skills you would require if you want to do this and how would you actually plan your career so obviously if you want to do astrophysics space sciences you have to be doing science so till your 12th standard you have to be doing science after that you could be doing a, a bachelor's in which should have obviously physics and maths should be part of your bsc degree so physics applied physics mathematics that's what you need and preferably going in for a masters in physics and then after that you can continue with a phd in physics or astronomy astrophysics you can you, you there is the net examination the csr ugc net examination if you clear that exam in india then you would get funding to do your phd research and uh, that would keep you financially independent so typically like i said in graduation you need to have done your bsc with physics maths maybe chemistry maybe computer science depending on your preference another good option is also to do an integrated masters program which is available in uh, you know a lot of universities in india the university of hyderabad also has it you have the icers and the, uh, you, the who also have integrated msc programs the iits have the integrated msc which is called engineering physics but essentially that's the physics program which you do it for five years so any kind of program of this kind would actually do for you depending upon where you uh, you know where you up to where you get admission and where you up to do it for post graduation if you do your bachelor's somewhere you typically need to do a masters in physics in any university in the country uh, if you uh, can fare better or get it in the iits or the icers a lot of these places also have what are called integrated phd programs which imply an msc and a phd put together so you'd have to do it after a bachelor's program or this is a good stage to even go overseas uh, if you go for your undergrad or your bsc abroad 
often you do not get fellowships and it would it could prove to be expensive but if you go after your msc uh depending on if you've done a four year bachelors you can go straight straight away for grad school or if you've done your msc and you go overseas at this stage you can actually get a complete fellowship so you'd be totally independent and uh, that could keep you going for india for example if you finish your masters right in any university in the country or wherever you do it there are various exams which you need to do before you join for your phd program the most common exam is called the jest or the joint entrance screening test and for almost all institutes in the country where you can do phd in astronomy astrophysics all of them come under the jest program and uh, so you have to give the jest exam which is often held in the month of february and uh, uh, some of the institutes actually have their own entrance exams so for example tifr has their own uh, graduate school exam which you can give it similarly the institute of astrophysics has their own exam ayuka ncra have the inat which is another exam which is there so you actually need to check uh, you can give the jest which will combine for all as well as you can give individual entrance exams to particular places that you apply for and obviously when you identify these places where you'd like to apply it obviously depends upon your areas because all these places in their country have their own focus areas you know for focus areas of research where they have their expertise for example if you apply in ncra national national center for radio astronomy obviously most of their work is related to the gmrt or with radio astronomy so you would obviously have to focus on radio similarly depending on which other institutes or whatever area you want it is a good idea to identify particular groups or particular people working there so that you can accordingly apply to the place which you know interests you because um, most of these places there are already working groups who are working in certain areas and uh, you have to see how you can fit into the existing structure which they have right they're not going to start a new area of research for you you will have to join the existing group to actually contribute with your work so accordingly you need to you know you you'll have to select the place you want to do and obviously it goes without saying that if you clear the ugc uh, csr net exam you will have your funding for research so irrespective of wherever you join you will anyway have funding for many of the places they expect you to have net funding net is considered a compulsory thing some of these places they also have a certain amount of money which is allocated for phd program through which they can pay you from their own funds for the phd program so you need to accordingly check for it but it's obviously a good idea if you can get some funding for your phd program uh, rather than you you know being self financed that's not a very good idea and obviously uh, like i showed you before for all this you have the overseas option also of going abroad so after finishing your msc for example or a four years bsc program you can go abroad you can go to europe you can go to the us and that's a whole different story of how to apply but uh, you'll find a lot of information on the net how to apply again like i told you it's a good idea to focus on the areas you are interested in the particular people you are interested in so that accordingly you can select the places you want to go to do not select the place like you know i want to go and stay in berlin for example you select berlin because there is somebody who stays there who's working on the area that interests you right so identify people identify areas and accordingly apply the other option which is also something i wanted to cover because there are a lot of students who have actually done their btechs right so if you are a btech for example you did your 12th standard with science and after that you did a btech here i have written btech computer science but in principle this would apply for any btech right so uh, after that you can uh, actually there are places where you can directly for example in many places you can directly join for grad school because you already have 16 years of education you have your 12th standard plus 4 years of btech so uh, in principle you can apply for grad school again abroad or if you're doing it in india uh, many many of the places ayuka ia etc all of them with a the btech you can apply and uh, that will then you while you're in the phd program you do your masters in physics and then eventually get your phd also so if you have a btech also there's no problem you can proceed doing a, either an mtech or an msc in physics astrophysics and in that way continue through the path again with uh, this thing 
There's also, for example, the option of IIST. This is the Indian Institute of, of Space Technology, which is in Trivandrum, which is the ISRO-run uh, institute. And uh, there you can directly apply after a BTEC and you join for the integrated PhD program after your BTEC. And the other advantage of this place is that you have five years of uh, you know, service in ISRO itself, which is guaranteed after you finish your course. So while you're doing your course, you get funded by ISRO. And then for five years, you can actually, you have to, there's a binding that you have to work for five years for ISRO. After that, if you want, you can continue or you can move off to some other place, but it can work out like that. So this is something very important because there are a lot of students who are from BTEC background who would then like to, for example, you know, who would like to do astronomy, astrophysics, but they are worried that, you know, I've done a BTEC, how do I get into astronomy? You very well can do that in most of these places. So you can give the JEST exam, you can give the GATE exam, uh, and you can, you know, get it through, through this path. The third part is, for again, the same thing, uh, a very similar one. You do your 12th standard with, for example, you did it with maths. Then you can, you can do it with maths or with physics, do your bachelor's with physics. Your MSc, you can even go in for mathematics if you like mathematics more. I have not mentioned that here. You can do your MSc in physics, astronomy, mathematics. And you could, for example, ISC has a joint astronomy program. So you can give the ISC entrance, you can through your gate or the entrance exams, and again, get it through the PhD program, right? So all these options are there. Now, after you do that, what are the career opportunities if you say do your PhD in astronomy? So typically, the simplest thing is to become a professor. You join a university or you join an institute where you become an astronomy professor, astrophysicist. You could be a research consultant somewhere. In some places, you can actually join as a research scientist or a research physicist, a scientist, an astronomer, physicist, etc. But typically, these are teaching research kind of uh, you know, jobs. I also wanted to mention that this is the, you know, the generally understood thing of astronomy that you would do uh, astrophysics and space science. But I also wanted to bring to your attention that there are many other areas also where you could actually do contribute and do some good work. So for example, there's a very upcoming area of astrobiology. Now, obviously, everybody is very, very much interested on whether there's life in outer space, whether there's, uh, you know, is exoplanets, is there habitability on exoplanets? What kind of atmospheres do they have? Is there life on other planets? Generally, when I give talks on astronomy, there's always somebody or the other who asks me whether um, is there life in the universe and things like that, right? So people are always interested in knowing that. Hello. So astrobiology is the field which basically studies the origin, evolution, distribution, future of life in the universe. And obviously, since it's astro and biology, Students need to have a background in biology as well as some amount of astronomy. And uh, this is a very upcoming area. Typically, it requires knowledge of astronomy. You may have some knowledge of geology, studying the Earth's physical composition, exploring gas, other minerals, etc. Some amount of space sciences, biomedical research, environment research, university-based. So all of these could be part of the work which you're doing in astrobiology, right? which could be incorporated in that. There's a very other important field coming up in astronomy, which is basically, uh, you know, data science, data science in astronomy, because there's so much of data available in, actually, I should have named it astrophysics as well as data science, because the tools that are, you know, now there's a paradigm shift in astronomy. There's a lot of data available in astronomy. Earlier, we did not have so much of data. And therefore, a lot of people who are interested in data science and artificial intelligence in data mining, in things like that, as well as astrostatistics, are also applying these uh, things to the field of astronomy. So there are a lot of astronomers who are actually collaborating with statisticians because they know how to handle the astronomy data much better compared to we did, because generally astronomy, we earlier had very small uh, data sets. We didn't have very large data sets, but now there are very large data sets, and therefore, um, you know, a good amount of statistics, data mining, big data, all these are also things which you could be involved in if you were do, dealing with the big data. Another important field is astrochemistry, which is in principle very much related to astrobiology. It is basically the study of the abundance and reaction of molecules in the universe, the interaction with radiation. And essentially, again, this is again 
closely related to the field of astrobiology, again, looking for life in the universe. And um, so, uh, so what, what I basically wanted to give with this example is that even if you're not a hardcore physics maths person, you know, uh, who's, uh, who's interested in astronomy, there's still a lot of space for people who are, would like to relate astronomy to other fields, right, in which you can actually find an overlap or uh, some, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, related studies which can be done in astronomy. Like I said, with astrochemistry, astrobiology, astro data science, and things like that. So there are many, many, uh, you know, ways in which you can actually uh, get into the thing. What is the salary and demand for astronomers? If you're in universities, you will get typical UGC scales, which is similar in institutes. But private salaries, for example, if you're working in a planetarium, for example, uh, obviously the salaries may vary and that may depend upon what is it, right? What is the other options? Uh, so actually, this is what I needed to tell you all about all the career paths in astronomy. And now the rest of the, the talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about what is actually happening in India in the field of astronomy and space research. Obviously, there's always the option of going abroad and working abroad. But I think the first thing one needs to do is uh, at least see what is actually happening in the field in the country so that you can see whether, you know, how would you fall in, in that paradigm of what's happening in the country. And then depending upon how that works out, you may actually opt to work abroad or work in the country. But it's good to know what's actually happening in the country. So the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to be focusing on this. Now that I've already told you about all the career paths and all the options that you can follow. So what about observatories in India? So astronomy, we have a lot of observatories in India comparatively. <coughs> so if you look over here, this is the Japal Rangapur Observatory, which is a 48 inch observatory. It's more than 50 years old. And uh, this is located very close to Hyderabad, about 60 kilometers from Hyderabad, not very far away. This is the telescope, which, which, the, which is, this is actually Aries. This is Denital. And Denital has a very similar telescope to this one, the 48 inch over here. It's a Carl Zeiss telescope, which is also located over here. This year, they'll complete 50 years of this telescope being here. And uh, so that, that, that was a very important telescope in the country. One of the largest ones we have in the country is a two meter telescope, which is in Ladakh. This is in Ladakh, Leh Ladakh. This is the Mount Abu Infrared Telescope, which is run by the Physical Research Laboratories of Ahmedabad. This one is in Mount Abu, Rajasthan. The Himalayan Chandra Telescope, Ladakh, is run by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore. Aries in Nainital runs this telescope. And this is the telescope, which is the Ayuka Giravali Telescope, which is near Pune, which is run by Ayuka. This is also a two-meter class telescope, close to this thing. The largest optical telescope we have at present is the one which is run by Aries, which is a 3.6 meter telescope. This is in a place called Devasthal, not very far from Nenital. And uh, it is, uh, it, like I said, it's a six meter telescope. And typically, this is the telescope, what it looks like. You can uh, have a, I mean, visit the telescope anytime possible. And uh, so here you have the main dome. It's an alt azimuth mount. And uh, you have various instruments on this telescope. The pride of India, I'd, I'd say, is the giant meter radio telescope. This is a telescope which is made up of 30 dishes, each of which have a diameter of 45 meters. It has a very special design called the smart antenna design. So basically, it's not made up of solid metal. Solid metal would cost more money as well as require more mechanical structure to support it. While this was a design which was made by Govind Swaroop, the father of radio astronomy in India, and it is a very unique telescope, one of its kind. Rather, uh, it's a world-class facility, which is very good for um, observations with low frequencies. And uh, <clears throat> so it's a more sensitive radio telescope in that particular frequency domain. And like I mentioned, you have 30 antennas at the shape of a Y. Each antenna has a shape, has a size of 45 meters. And uh, using radio telescopes, you must have heard about the Event Horizon Telescope, where you basically synthesize data from various telescopes to make it behave as though it has a larger size, right? So though each telescope has a size of only 45 meters, and it's about this large area, 
but what happens is it gives you an effective size which is equivalent to this size right so what you can do in longer wavelengths with uh, with like it has been done with event horizon telescope it's been done with gmrt also you can do this technique which is called aperture synthesis which lets you synthesize a larger diameter size and uh, you know you get very good resolution images uh, using this telescope there's another radio telescope which we have in india which is called the uti radio telescope this is around a north south slope so this is made up of basically parabolic antennas and the advantage of having it on the north south slope is that the stars like the sun they rise in the east and they set in the west so you uh, as the stars rise the telescope only has to steer itself along one motor right to see the rise of stars and the set of stars and it's just going to do this and uh, in that way it becomes a much more simpler mechanical design because you just have to steer the telescope in only one particular direction right for it to actually uh, you know for it to track objects so it's basically like i told you it's made up of a 150 meter long 30 meter wide cylindrical parabolic telescope it essentially works at the frequency of 326.5 megahertz and like i mentioned this is an ot um one of the telescopes which india is very strongly involved in is called the tmt the tmt is the 30 meter telescope which is basically the primary mirror has a size of 30 meters and it's basically made up of a hexagonal array of these mirrors each of them have a size of 1.4 meters and they kind of it's it is a honeycomb structure with which you get the primary mirror and uh, <clears throat> it is basically an international collaboration of india japan china canada and the us india is a 10% contributor in this thing and we are contributing in cash as well as in kind so essentially india has been doing uh, the mirrors the sensors the software for data acquisition and uh, very strongly involved in pmt and uh, it's a very important project because it gives uh, the country first hand training on actually how to build a 30 meter telescope which includes the hardware as well as the software of the building of the telescope right because instrumentation earlier in india instrumentation was not given that much of importance but now people you know have actually realized that we do need to pay a lot of attention to instrumentation because a certain amount of instrumentation instruments can be bought directly but a certain amount of instrumentation should be done locally in house so that depending upon the telescope and the instruments we are actually using we can tailor make it to our requirements right so uh, the tmt is obviously something for the future which would be very important for us but other than that it's a very good training program for our um, future astronomers as well as instrument builders to actually learn how to build instruments uh, including the ones at tmt The other big uh, uh, mega project that India is involved in is called the Square Kilometer Array. Now, the Square Kilometer Array is a radio astronomy project across two different continents, South Africa and Australia, and you have, uh, you know, you have a combination of these thousands, uh, you know, thousands of kilometers of uh, area where you have these uh, dishes being put and designed. It's a consortium of a large number of countries, of which India is also part of the thing. and it's something which people are really very strongly looking forward to from the radio astronomy area now india also has an astronomical society of india where astronomers are put together into a into a, a group which actually has meetings regularly every year they they have um, you know they they publish their stuff and they have meetings workshops interactions etc the organized thing the other important thing which i'd like to talk about in terms of india is so in short in india i should have actually had a slide i'm sorry i should have had a slide on the various institutes we have in the country so you have the tfr in bombay there is pune which has ayuka and ncra then we have in ahmedabad you have the physical research laboratories in nenital i should have put a map i'm sorry i should have put one in nenital you have aries then in bangalore you have the indian institute of astrophysics you have the raman research institute and you have the indian institute of science then in trivandrum you have the iist and we have all the icers and the iits 
all of these places are places where you do have astronomy faculty and people actually working in astronomy as well as many of the universities in the country also have astronomers employed in the physics departments who are actively uh, doing research in astronomy so one can actually join any of them and work, do their work the other important thing which many of you all may be interested in is the space program right so india is one of the five countries who have their own space program and therefore it's very important that we have a lot of young um, you know young blood young potential which actually gets into the space program because we have such an active space program we <clears throat> this is an example of the pslv launch vehicle the launch for mangalyaan which happened in 2013 5th november now isro uh, many people actually question why would a country like india which was actually you know developing countries why should we actually invest so much of money into isro but uh, the indian space program as it was conceived by vikram sarabhai was actually meant to support society and development of the country and therefore he actually vikram sarabhai believed that india being a poor country actually needs to have a space program because that is very important in our development and uh, therefore isro has been doing various things like developing powerful launch vehicles so that it can it does it's independent it does not need foreign service providers for heavy satellites and involved in a scientific program to explore the solar system you have i'm sure heard about the chandrayaan mission uh, this is chandrayaan 1 many of you all have heard about the mangalyaan mission which was the first mission of uh, the first planetary mission of isro to explore mars and uh, <clears throat> mangalyaan was a small mission in principle it's about only about 1300 kilo kgs it's about the size of a small car but essentially the way it was launched by isro it was meant to demonstrate the technological maturity of the indian space industry and uh, something very important to remember is that the launch vehicles that we have at isro are not as powerful as for example the american ones so uh, americans at that time also had a had a program to mars which was called the mom the maven mission right for which was launched by the atlas 5 uh, launch vehicle and the advantage with that is that that would directly launch to mars but the problem is the indian launch vehicle cannot go straight to mars it does not have that much of capacity and therefore what um, the isro what they do is that they do this kind of a thing which is called a slingshot mechanism you actually launch and you actually have elliptical parking orbits so when you launch the uh, the, the the satellite you actually have an elliptical parking orbit you have to give boosters to the thing at various points and uh, as you give boosters you increase the elliptic of the orbit and then at one point you can actually uh, you know the sixth point that that's when it actually aims straight from mars now mars comes into close proximity every two years so if you want to plan a mission to mars it can be done within those two years window and that's exactly when you need to plan the mission but it's obviously uh, 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 if you uh, see this thing it's obviously a very difficult thing because what you want to do is you have to actually plan these orbits these intermediate orbits parking orbits and then at a certain point you have to give it a boost so that it directly goes to mars and then it should get captured by mars so this actually involves a lot of very precise calculations as to what are the kind of boosts you are going to do how are you going to change the trajectory so that finally you know it gets captured by mars and it can be actually you have the mars martian orbit insertion taking place that's the most crucial part because otherwise if the if you know the mission goes here and does not get captured by mars you will just go across and you'll miss mars and the whole mission would be failed and therefore the the mom mission was actually a very beautiful example of how with very precise calculations one could very precisely aim straight for mars and uh, you know it it actually went there so like i said this this the boris operandi used because you do not have that strong uh, a vehicle you actually use this is called the mother of all slingshots where you actually loop it like this and finally reach the position of mars right and uh, so we had six boosts and finally the sixth boost you actually reach escape velocity go there and that's when you have mass insertion and it's seven it's about a two two years about 780 year days for the next window 
when you can again approach Mars and actually plan a mission of that kind. Now, the, the MOM mission was something very important for the Indian space program because uh, it was the first ever country to succeed in the Mars mission in its first attempt. All other countries who have had Mars missions, they've always succeeded, not in the first, but in, you know, the after repeated attempts. But for India, it was the first attempt which was successful. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, in principle, if you actually see the strike rate of the 22 Mars orbiter missions tried by different countries, only nine have been successful. So the success rate also for, mom, for Mars missions is very low. And India is now the fourth nation or group of nations because ESA, the European Space Agency, is actually a group of nations. So you have the US, you have Russia, and you have ESA, the European Space Agency, and India, now the fourth country who's actually managed a mission to Mars. Another important part about the Indian space program is obviously it's very tight on the budget, right? And therefore, because of that, uh, you can actually see NASA's MAVID mission cost about $671 million, while uh, our mission was barely $74 million, which is something very, very you know, low budget. Compared to, you can look at the other missions. This is the ESA mission, which costed $386. The Japanese one costed $189. The Russian one cost $177. So uh, India also, the other important part of our space program is we manage our thing with a very low budget because the budget is tight. Um, ISRO also launched a special satellite called AstroSat, whose basic job was to just do astronomy. So it's basically made up of three X-ray uh, telescopes. There's the LAX-PC, SXT, and the CZT. These are three X-ray telescopes. There's an ultraviolet telescope called the UVIT, and this is a scanning sky monitor the SSM. And uh, therefore, what you can see is that uh, this was the mission which was dedicated specifically for astronomy. It's still very much operational. And uh, <clears throat> it observes at a very large range of wavelengths, ranging from X-rays, ultraviolets, opticals. And uh, uh, AstroSat was a very also good example of how the payloads were essentially built by, there was foreign collaboration, but a lot of the stuff was actually built by different centers in India, ISRO centers, as well as TIFR, IA, IUCA, et cetera, NCRA, PRL, RRI, and a few foreign collaborations with which they actually built the instruments for it. So these are the different instruments which are available on AstroSat. And um, it is still very much operational. You can actually write for proposals to observe with AstroSat, to observe with the different instruments. As well as AstroSat on the web, it already has an archival site where you can access data which has already been acquired by AstroSat. So in case you want to do some specific research on that data, you can actually have a look at the archival site to actually consider what other data is there. Now, uh, <clears throat> here, for example, so uh, we also have, uh, I should have shown this earlier, but this is PSLV, which actually launched AstroSat in orbit. This was launched in 2015. It orbits at a height of about 650 kilometers above with a slight inclination of about six degrees. Right. And you can have a better look at the spacecraft. Here you have the X-ray telescope. You have the LAX-PC, the ultraviolet telescope. This is the CZTI and the SXT and the scanning sky monitor. Right. These are all the other things. Again, a, a better look at the instruments on AstroSat, which I have already mentioned earlier, right? Now, another thing is after Chandrayaan-1, the other big mission was the Chandrayaan-2 mission, which was done by, the, by ISRO, which actually had an important feature that it had a lander as well as a rover. So you had this, the orbiter, and then you had a lander and a rover also, which was this thing. And uh, <clears throat> the lander was Vikram, and the rover was Pragyan. Okay, so this was um, this the moon. This was it was launched in 2019 at the cost of about 143 million dollars. So uh, most of you all must have seen the uh, you know the the telecast live telecast which was done for Chandrayaan two when it reached the moon, and uh, but then there was a glitch due to which um, the lander failed because the lander. Did, it was supposed to have what is called a soft landing, but it was not that soft. And therefore, the, 
the lander and the rover part of the mission failed, but the orbiter is still very much going around and it's still giving us data from the moon, uh, the orbiter. So that's an example of this, uh, the, the mission. And uh, the, yeah, so this was launched by the GSLV Mark II launcher. And uh, that's the thing. Now, the Indian Space Program has a whole set of uh, plans for the future, uh, which include Chandrayaan-3. That means there's a sequel to Chandrayaan-2. And like I told you, Vikram lander was, had failed. But uh, uh, to now the, the, the Chandrayaan-3, three, three, which is being planned, Again, it has a lander and a rover, where we hope to have learned from our mistakes, with the mistakes which took place in the case of uh, Chandrayaan 2. And we hope to learn from our mistakes so that we then have a lander and a rover. Uh, this is the expected launch. I found it somewhere on the web. It said 2021. It did not happen. It has been postponed, and hopefully it should happen in the next year or two. There's the Gaganyaan mission, which is actually the mission of actually... Uh, I think I'll be talking about, okay, we'll be talking about these in more detail. So we have the Gaganyaan of sending man in space. There is the lunar polar exploration mission. There's the Aditya mission, which I'll just talk to you about, which is, this is going to be launched very soon, hopefully this year itself. There is the radar imaging satellite. There's the Nisar, Bangalan 2, as well as the Shukrayan, which is the mission to Venus. So Aditya L1, this mission is almost ready. And it is planned to be, this is an older thing which I found on the net which said launch date for 2019-20. But the launch, uh, it should hopefully happen this year or maximum next, next year because all the work for this has been done. This is a much more, uh, you know, like I told you, AstroSat is just at the height of 650 meters, right? But Aditya will go to the L1 point. The L1 point is the Lagrange point. And this is the point where the uh, gravitational force of the Earth and the Sun gets balanced. So it has actually got to go to a larger distance and uh, to the L1, this thing. Aditya, like its name suggests, is dedicated to study the sun. So it's basically just going to study the sun and uh, give us very important information because we know that we need to know the space weather very well, basically based on the solar activity. Mangalyan 2, after Mangalyan 1, the success of Mangalyan 1. Now Mangalyan 2 is being planned. And this time, Mangalyan 2 is expected to have a lander as well as a rover. And like I said, that hopefully we've learned from our lessons from the Chandrayaan 2 Vikram lander, so that the Mangalyan lander as well as the Chandrayaan 3 lander also, the lander and rover would work out. And uh, this is the next mission which we have to Mangalyan. Gaganyan, like I told you, the thing of three persons in space. This is also a mission being planned and uh, a lot of activity is happening. This is being done with the Russians. So if you actually compare various existing facilities which we had, I will, you know, sum up the facilities which we have because if you, um, you know, if you would, like I said, if you want to have a career in astronomy, you need to focus it based on the people who are working in areas as well as the focus. So for example, uh, I told you this thing, I told you, this is where you had the Himalayan Chandra Telescope, which I told you is located at uh, Ladakh, two meter telescope. This is the DOT, the 3.6 meter telescope. I told you about Aries. Here is the, 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 the other telescope, which is the Sampuranan telescope, 48 inch, which is also there in Aries. This is the Udaipur Solar Observatory, which studies the sun very beautifully. It's in the middle of a lake. Mount Abu. This is an infrared telescope. There's a new one also, which is going to come over there. There's the GMRT, which is here near Pune. You have the IGO, the Ayuka Giravali Observatory, which is also located over here. There is also another radio telescope, which I forgot to mention, which is the Gauri Bidnur Telescope. This is not far from Bangalore, in a place called Gauri Bidnur. This is the Uti Radio Telescope down south over here. And then there's the Kodai Kodai Observatory, which is also run by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, who runs Himalayan Chandra Telescope. They run the Kodai Kodai Observatory, as, a, as well as the VBO, the Venu Bapu Observatory. These, these are also down south, these two telescopes. All of them are run by the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. All of them are very good facilities. We can actually compare it with the global facilities which we have. So globally, actually, there are space telescopes, the HST, JWST, future, which would be the Roman, the ground-based ones, 
you see in ground based we actually clearly lack access to a 8 or 10 meter tars telescope so there is a lot of work being done to try to uh, you know get funding etc for a 8 meter telescope i forgot to mention but along with the 3.6 meter telescope aries has also built a liquid mirror telescope which is a 4 meter telescope so it's basically made up of a, a mercury liquid mirror and uh, it 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 obviously the problem is it will only observe things which are on zenith but that is also it's it's going to do its first flight next year it's already ready the telescope and um, so that's the kind of facilities we have in india not too bad <clears throat> not too great still so i would like to actually wind up with this that uh, essentially uh, i think you know the cost this is one of the quotes of carl sagan which says that the cosmos is within us we are made of the star stuff we are a way for the universe to know itself and therefore if you actually uh, you know astronomy is essentially a way of us trying to learn ourselves you know study our own origin where did we come from where are we going what are we doing how was the universe formed right and answer to these questions lie in various fields it is not just physics it's physics chemistry biology computer science it's a mix of all these things which will actually give us the answers and therefore you can actually uh, uh, you know you can uh, uh, approach this question or try to study this using all these various career paths right to study the universe and study astronomy yeah so thanks uh, yeah and these that will give us important answers to these very important questions as to where do we come from what are we and where are we going so thank you i'll end with this and i'll be happy to take questions thank you thank you so much ma'am such uh, illustrative presentation and uh, very much options and also about the upcoming projects uh, one can understand with this presentation so thank you for that uh, and yes. also i would like to add that uh, like about the job uh, career option which we were talking about planetarium uh, uh, in the coming time probably there there will be more uh, job openings related to uh, science communicator and educators in all the pla uh, planetariums across uh, india uh, and also isro is also uh, posting many of the jobs related to research and all so anyone uh, with the bsc msc and phd with the astrophysics or physics or in some of the uh, some of the organization they are as asking btech be uh, and bsc so they can also uh, happy to join those organizations so many of the yeah. students were in between also posting that uh, they are really happy to attend your session because they have given you have given them many insight about the more career option one can opt so we will now open the session for the question and answer and i'll be posting it on the screen so that you can also have a look okay sure uh, navin yeah. how i can study astrochemistry or study of chemical composition of deep sky please help me with that yeah so uh, actually astrochemistry like like it like was you need to do astronomy and chemistry in india it's not a very this thing but i can actually uh, but you know what what people do is that they for example uh, try to build uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an early earth kind of situation right to actually see where could you uh, you know you you try to in the lab you try to generate create a kind of a uh, um, what you to say uh, you could actually create a kind of environment of the early earth right to study as to what are the things that were available in early earth which people could actually um, you know um, whether the conditions for life so actually a simulation was done this was very ba way back in the 70s it was actually done to see whether in early earth with the chemical composition of the earth if you had lightning and you had things like that can you actually create amino acids right amino acids which is the base of life so the check was that can you actually create amino acids to uh, you know to form life for example again to study uh, this is actually astrobiology study of life etc a lot of uh, the other thing also people do this is with life but you may also be studying in very detail like if you saw the james webb images right there is the image of the spectra of that exoplanet and the idea is you want to know the chemistry of that exoplanet so for example you have data which is the spectrum for that exoplanet but you need a chemist who can actually look at the data and uh, you know get the chemistry from the spectrum that means it says that okay this ex exoplanet 
has whatever chemical composition and what is the material which is you know sitting in it some of you all may be even aware about the work which was being done on phosphine in in venus right so you obviously mm -hmm. get the data through telescopes you're getting data from telescopes to check out whether there is phosphine in um, in on venus for example but once you get the spectrum etc then it's a chemist job to actually see uh, you know whether phosphine can exist over there or is that truly the spectrum of phosphine because some of the arguments for phosphine was also that that is silicon dioxide spectrum that is what uh, you know the critics said that the spectrum was they detected silicon dioxide and not phosphine so obviously an astronomer will not know that but a chemist will be able to differentiate between the spectrum of phosphine and uh, for example sulfur dioxide so this is in basically understanding the spectroscopy or the atmosphere of exoplanets or other such exotic things right so in that uh, if you have a knowledge of chemistry you can apply it to the astrobo so it's like an intersection you need to know chemistry also and you need to know astronomy also so that you can combine it so i was actually googling and seeing uh, if you actually um, i uh, all of us google so i am just going to google again and i hope you can um, see what i'm sharing so for example um, i'm sharing my screen and you can see when i googled astrochemistry right you can see that there are various places where you know you can actually search for astrochemistry and actually find people who are working in that area right so um, there are definitely this is american chemical society you see which is actually working in astrochemistry or you could actually see this is princeton you can actually see in princeton there are these lectures or there are various things happening so uh, you should actually look so the astrophysics and astrochemistry laboratory uh, you know there are actually people who are doing research on uh, you know it basically studies the physical chemical properties of interstellar cometary asteroidal patterns there could be even some samples you know people have got samples from some asteroid or something like that and they actually used it so for example this is also at harvard astrochemistry you can see um i hope you can see this that this is the center for astrophysics at harvard and even they have a group which actually works in astro in astrochemistry right so essentially um part so they work on uh, okay I, i this is not coming here but they had to have a group over there also which works on astrochemistry so you should actually identify places where people are working on astrochemistry right you can see this is at harvard you have a group over there and they study various molecules that constitute the dust which make planets and purpose us for life and all that but that's a very interesting area of research so i have to stop the screen share yeah uh your audio is not there uh, uh, yeah. can you uh, explain about the physics job options yeah so this is for the job option as i understand so like i said one of the standard things is university jobs or in institutes that's where you will be doing research or you will be teaching or you will be doing a combination of both some places you may do more teaching some places you may do your this thing so uh, the thing is that if you have a phd in physics for example you can be taken into any physics department in the country right so you can be employed like i said in any university in any institute uh, the other things which i was telling you is the other things like what even what pragna was prena was talking about is if you then go in for education outreach those kind of things are other things but a physicist job would essentially mean you work in some university or in an institute which is basically research teaching or a combination of both so that would be how we would work yeah um because astro uh, chemistry questions are many in our chat box okay great <laughs> ma'am what are the qualification required for astro chemistry yeah so uh, like i said if you like i i showed you right the thing the group over here for example uh, you can get in through the chemistry side or you can get in through the astronomy side so if you even have a chemistry background right say you've done a masters in chemistry right and then you identify a place uh, unfortunately in india there aren't many groups which are working in astrochemistry right it's because typically if you want to have a lab on this 
you will need very good funding etc for the lab so in india somehow we uh, we do not have many groups over there but for example again i'm showing you the cfa the harvard uh, option you can see that here you have you can identify the group and with your masters in chemistry also you can actually apply to such a place and tell them that you would like to uh, you know work in this thing so essentially it would be in obviously a masters in uh, astro or in chemistry both of them uh, you'll have to just check up uh, where are you applying and uh, you know uh, how uh, how whether that place like if what i showed you those are basically astronomers but similarly you can look for chemistry departments which have an astrochemistry program right so uh, but those options do exist yeah but especially in in europe there are many many uh, there are many many groups working in um, in leiden etc there are many groups which work in this like for example one of the things could be just looking for water so like the james webb uh, spectrum which you saw it basically basically showed the spectrum the spectrum of water on that exoplanet right so either you look for amino acids or you look for water or some such traces of life or habitability right okay so sama salim asked uh, ma'am another question i'm quite interested in uh, the thought like how actually chemicals are synthesized as formed in space or vacuum and what actually lead to star formation yeah so actually so that that is uh, you know more from the astro part of view with this there's a area in astronomy called nucleosynthesis okay we know that most of the universe is hydrogen or helium so then where does this for example calcium in our bones where does that come from right so that basically gets synthesized in stars so there is something called nuclear synthesis where we actually study how does material get synthesized in the universe and uh, that is also very important and very closely related to abundance right for example why is gold a precious metal that is because fusing and generating gold, uh, gold is not an easy job due to which its abundance is low in the universe and that makes it a precious metal right or platinum so you know that heavy elements are more difficult to fuse in stars and therefore the abundance of those heavy elements is low and uh, therefore so that, that that is a pure astronomy thing so you basically study it through astronomy and you see how chemicals are synthesized in space so that's a branch in astronomy nuclear synthesis you'll have to do that somehow so then we have astronomical hub ma'am i want to ask that if i try to go abroad for msc program so which country are good in it and if any university you want to suggest okay so in principle uh, i mean the standard thing is people go to europe they go to us they also go to china china is also a big uh, you know big leader now because there's a lot of money being invested into education and science so essentially you know you you could you could study it in india you could study i i would say uh, the important question to ask in this is not which country is good at it but for example which group or which person so supposing if something interests you like the previous question sama asked about nuclear synthesis right so supposing you google nuclear synthesis and you look for which are the groups in the world which are working in that area right then you accordingly identify and you say that okay a group in for example in heidelberg is working on that so you go to heidelberg for that so the question to ask is uh, which country is good at the subject or the area you are interested in for example you may want to do um, gravitational waves right and uh, gravitational waves is a very specialized thing so you're not going to find it everywhere so obviously you need to look for where are the institutes in the country or abroad where you can find people working on gravitational waves and accordingly you do so uh, astronomical hub i'd like to suggest that you look for the area you want identify people who are you know good in the field right look for their publications just google it you'll be able to see what has so and so published in some area and that will itself give you the idea as where should you go to because you should go to the place where people are doing what you are interested in right if you go to a place where they are working on something else it is you know you won't be happy you have to do it where you want to do it right so i think that's the and uh, this is the most important question i think many of the enthusiasts are dealing with it ma'am currently i am a student of msc physics i have raised my interest in astronomy and astrophysics but i have not studied about it in my studies can i join it now yeah definitely you can join it yeah so harmandeep uh, what you need to do is uh, like i gave you that list 
There is the JEST exam, the Joint Entrance Screening Test, which is held in February. So you have time now to study for it. So you have to register for that. You'll give the exam in February. It's a combined exam for a lot of institutes. And depending on your rank, you can get it in different places. You can Google and see astronomy institutes in India, for example. Many of them run their own entrance exam other than JEST. So JEST exists, but other than that, you can give their entrance exam and also apply for it like that. Similarly, uh, if you want to uh, go abroad, you can, uh, you can, you're doing your MSc in physics, you have to give your GRE exam, give your GRE TOEFL. Again, look for places where there is a PhD program in Astro and you can go. It's very good if you can try to do a little bit of a project before you go because that adds a lot of weight to your application if you have done some project. So uh, depending on wherever you are studying your physics, MSc, if you in that place you have somebody, if there's some faculty who's working in Astro or in your city, if you can find somebody working in Astro, then it would be a very good idea if you can also do a little project with that person, because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, that is the thing uh, which will give your application a lot of weight, because otherwise, uh, you know, the, the person who's taking you would like to see whether you have any skill in research or in astronomy. So if you can try to add it with some further project or something like that, but you can apply. You're in the right time to apply. You're, you're not at all uh, left behind. You just have to give GEST, give GATE, give UGC NET, get your NET qualification and then uh, get it in India or abroad, wherever. Not a problem. Mandeep, I, I think you got the clarification on your doubt. Now I'm taking two questions, ma'am. I think they both are uh, interrelated, so I'll be showing them. So uh, Ashok Kumar, I'm taking the screen name. Student of class 11, thinking about astronomy as a career. What what are your suggestions on this? And on the same line, uh, someone is asking, which are some of the best college university after 12th or BSc yeah. degree? In yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so uh, the universe, I mean, many of the universities have integrated MSc program, which is BSc, MSc combined, right? Which is also there in all the ICERs. There are the ICERs which are all around the country. Uh, and you can do an integrated MSc program in the ICERs. The IITs have an engineering physics program, but that's also good enough with that also you can then uh, join in this thing. So, like I said, the option is you do your BSc. Uh, I don't know which city you're talking about, and I will not know all the best colleges in the city. You will know better what are the colleges in the city, but you can join just a BSc program which has maths and physics. It should have maths and physics. Do the BSc program, and then you do your MSc in physics, right? Or like I said, you do an integrated MSc program, which will be after your 12th standard. It's a straight five-year program, which is integrated MSc in some of the universities or in the ICERs, right? Uh, so you have to basically focus on that, on physics and maths uh, uh, in your BSc or integrated MSc. Yeah. Uh, so we have one more question. Sovam Acharya, as a citizen scientist, can have career in astronomy? Yeah. Hello, Sovam sir. So, uh, so a, a career in uh, you are a very much active citizen scientist, mm -hmm. Sovam sir. So. Uh, about a career, if a career actually, it depends on what you're talking about a career. If a career means that it should be a source of income, then it obviously, there has to be somebody who will employ you for that thing. So uh, there are some people, I won't mention them, who actually make money on making people do astronomy projects. They charge school children and various children and they charge them and put them into this thing. In that way, they make uh, money. But uh, otherwise, uh, you can make a career in the sense that if you are, for example, guiding people onto citizen science projects, like which you anyway do, uh, like I'm saying, the only catch in that comes is that uh, you can do it as a full time job. But the problem is if you want to get a salary for it, you want to get paid for it, right? Then that becomes a more complicated thing. But I'm, sh I'm sure once some people can work it out, you can do it. But uh, uh, I don't know how easy it is because uh, you know, you literally have to tell people, oh, you want to look for asteroid hunting, I will charge you like 5,000 rupees for uh, one month course or something like that. So I don't know uh, how exactly you can uh, generate an income using that. It can be done. Definitely it can, can be done because there will be places and people 
who will be willing to pay money to do projects. I'm sure there are kind, but uh, I'm not an expert on how that can be done. So uh, you, you, I think you'll have to try it out yourself. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, career in the sense of uh, I'll answer. I'll answer it from the second point of view. If it is not about money, it's not about earning, right? Then if you're just doing it out of the love of the subject and you're doing things, yes, definitely you can make a name for yourself in the field because you see that uh, when citizen science projects, they identify exoplanets, they identify asteroids, they do various things, right? Classify galaxies, etc. So the citizen scientist person can actually publish uh, scientific articles based on the scientific results which they get using their citizen science projects, right? So you can join into mainstream astronomy by actually getting scientific results from your citizen science projects. So in that way, making a career as an astronomer, you can publish the scientific results you get. Like there's an exoplanet watch team also, which actually tracks exoplanets, which is then used by, uh, for example, people who want to observe with Hubble. You can't observe with Hubble straight away, such a, you know, such a big telescope. You have to find out candidates, right? So you may actually monitor some amount of exoplanets so that you form a certain list of candidates. You uh, pick up targets, for example, for Hubble or James Webb. You pick up targets using this other data. So that can be done by a citizen science scientist. And you can actually publish your results that these are potential targets, for example, for James Webb or for Hubble. And in that way, you can have a career as an astronomer. You know, you can actually contribute, be called an astronomer, be doing astronomy things. Uh, so in that way, you can get out science from it in that way. I hope I've answered it, but uh, not too well. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am, for clarification. Uh, I, I think this is one of the curious questions in the chat box. Ma'am, scientists have developed such an amazing telescope to observe planet and star with high uh, pixel quality. So my doubt is why Sagittarius, a black hole, is too blurry. Okay. So first of all, the definition of a black hole is something from which light cannot escape, right? So irrespective of what telescope you make, since light cannot escape from that, there is no light which you can track from it, so you anyway cannot observe, right? So that is the definition of a black hole. What we actually do is we observe the neighborhood of the black hole, the area around of the black hole. And the area around the black hole, uh, for example, uh, it's very dusty because there's an accretion disk. So one way of observing it is in the infrared. So that is what was done by the group which studied the black hole in the center of the Milky Way. Okay, so that was the group uh, which, uh, you know, which got the Nobel Prize two years back for studying the black hole in the center of the Milky Way in the infrared. The other way out is you observe it in the X-ray, for example, in high energy, because it will also emit in high energy. So in, uh, in the case of uh, black holes, you either observe it in X-ray or in... Um, gamma ray in high energy or you observe it in infrared or things like that and uh, why is it so blurry because i don't know which image do you see but essentially in the center part if there's lots of gas and dust you won't be able to see much over there and that's why it gets blurry so a telescope can help you observe but obviously uh, there are limitations to this thing because so for example that's what james webb will do that because james webb is in infrared it's going to look through all the gas and dust so if you actually look at uh, dusty objects, you will be able to see very well through that with James Webb, which Hubble could not do. But uh, um, but, uh, but but yeah, looking at a black hole itself is a tough thing. So Event Horizon Telescope, it did it in millimeter, this thing, right? In millimeter wavelengths, that too, by synthesizing a dish, which is the size of the Earth, because you are taking data from various telescopes all over the Earth, right? So it's a tricky job. And uh, with this one, many thank you from your lovely students that they completely enjoyed the session, very informative session. And yes, it will be available on the Planetarium YouTube uh, channel for further references. So they are very curious that after the session get over, will it be available for the reference and all? Yes, yeah. it will be available. And they so, can uh, continue. Uh, sorry, I just mentioned that they can continue adding their questions also to the, you know, the YouTube video. You can add questions. I can once in a while have a look at it and see if there are some questions. Or you can email me, right? Anything. Another question. Give me a little guidance. Okay. You'll be taking this. Another question, ma'am. Please give me a little guidance that uh, 
is it possible to achieve my phd in astrochemistry in india i think uh, oh okay okay so what i'm going to do in i'm actually cheating in the sense i'm actually googling astrochemistry in india so actually there is the physical research lab okay which is the prl which is in uh, which is in i'll just share this thing which is in amdabad okay and uh, over there there is actually a group which works on it and uh, i will just now share that with you just a minute so if you actually see there is the astrochemistry society of india okay so you actually have a society and there is a person shashikiran ganesh who is in charge over there he is very active in it and uh, you can actually please log into this site i will um, you can see this website over here with prl and you can log into this thing and uh, over here if you see there are some opportunities we can say this is the person dr ankan das project scientist you can see that there's a jrf position wow this is exactly what you wanted so they have advertised for a jrf this is for a phd student this thing and it invites application from candidates for this thing and this so you i think you should get in touch with this person called ankan das and amit basu as well as these people they are mentioned over here right you can click on the name and you will get the email and the details so here you'll get the email itself if you i'm sure sorry to open my email so this is the email shashi@prl.rest.in but uh, these are the people in the country who are working on astrochemistry so shashi kiran ganesh works on comets code ism this person shivaram uh, deals in simulating astrochemical ices in the laboratory amit basu works on geochemical evolution of mars and um, so you can accordingly uh, look for what interests you right and get in touch with these people uh, most people will reply to you and uh, you can find out from them so have a look at opportunities have a look at their events they are having a conference also okay this was an old one sorry these are old ones but you can also have a look at publications to see what are the things they are publishing and what are they doing as well as other resources right so you can Even have a look at this as project in india yeah i have also written to mr sashi kiran ganesh so i think planetarium can organize one session for more clarifications yeah 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 he is i mean he's a good friend and he'll do a very good job on astrochemistry so, so i think that yeah, really so i think good. yeah of the other people mentioned over there actually sashi is the one i know personally also so okay. you can probably shamta you can get in touch with him and check up with him but uh, so essentially prl is where you need to head to to amdabad prl that's where it is Uh, so we can take uh, Vidya, ma'am. Do astrophysicists study black holes and discover things in space? I think this yes, is yes, yes. That's good. that's what their job is. That's what their job is. Our job is to study things in space and discover new things. Hopefully. Again, when I love the I love to join the session by Dr. Sashikar, and definitely Planetarium will help you with yeah. that. But very soon, uh, we'll try to organize one session with. Uh, and uh, some of the people are uh, writing the planetarium to offer such course as if not no um, but we will try to plan certain uh, extensive hands on learning workshops not course in terms of like you have to pay money and get certificate for that not in that term but uh, it will be free but will give you the hands on experience to learn something intensive in that way planetarium can certainly help you with that yeah. so i think uh, yes ma'am yes please. i remember that's what he, that's what even uh, Dr. Ratna Shree, we we visited also many times, and that's what she was keen on student doing projects. So if there's some hands-on session, then you know they can even we did some hands-on things, so yes, they can yes. you know try. Her her motive was that to get some hands-on learning rather than uh, just coming here in the planetarium and spending time exactly. on Zoom, but also and definitely will will try to pull her legacy uh, uh, forward in the coming time by yeah. offering such hands-on learning experience in under the guidance of uh, such dignitaries and expert in their respective field. So I think with this we'll wrap today's session, ma'am. It was really yeah. highly interactive and uh, very like uh, completely involved. Students are completely participants. On and participants are completely involved though it was online we don't have that opportunity to interact with you in personal but still the amount of messages we were getting in the chat box can completely uh, can completely give their uh, insight that how amazing that uh, they have uh, clarified their doubts related to their career options and paths in the coming time so thank you very much ma'am for that yeah
Thanks a lot. Yeah, even now that you said, I'm seeing them. They're good. Very many. <laughs> so we have lots and lots of many. Uh, thank you uh, in the chat box about the session. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your time. And thank you, everyone, for yeah. coming and giving your precious time to uh, be active participant in this uh, program. And definitely in the coming time, we'll come with uh, more uh, very interactive topics to get more clarification. So thank you, everyone. Do take care. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.